This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven, and various guests. And today I've got a pair of very exciting guests. So I've got Martha Carney from the Today programme. I'm somebody who wakes up very early in the morning and I really often get the shipping forecast, which I have to say, hmm, not so keen on myself, having had it seven days a week. Actually, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, and then I move on to farming today and I'm always very happy when it's 6 a.m. and I hear Martha's voice. So I'm sure lots of you are like me and you're a passionate Radio 4 listeners. And the reason that Martha's on Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange is she's a, a really strong proponent of the bee, the pollinator and biodiversity in general. So welcome to Martha. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm a huge fan of your garden, so it's a real pleasure. Well, that's so nice. And with Martha is Nicola Bradbear. And the reason that they've come together is that they have an amazing charity, which we're going to talk quite a lot about, which is Bees for Development. And it's something that we all believe in, but they're really working at. And it's basically how bees are not just good for the planet, but they are good for people and for people in less advantaged society than we have. So we're going to hear all about that. But before we do um, launch into talking about the charity, Martha, I wonder if you'd just describe to us how you've got involved with the whole bee plight and, and why you care about it. Well, as you say, I do care passionately about bees, but the reason I got involved in a way is pretty random. And it was because... We bought a cottage called Beehive Cottage, Chris, my husband and I, and we got married there. And some friends clubbed together to buy us a beehive as a wedding present. Mm. And they got the hive and they got us a smoker and they got us a whole beekeeper's veil and outfit. And I looked at these things and I thought, this is so far beyond my comfort zone or anything I know anything about. Never mind. So I painted the lovely WBC hive and put it in the corner of the garden as an ornament. And then I met a lady locally who was a beekeeper and she said she'd run out of space in her garden. So could she put a hive in ours? And meanwhile, she'd teach me. So I thought, wow. well, that's too good an opportunity to miss. So that's how I started. And I can remember that and she gave me a colony and I remember that moment, as all beekeepers will, when you first open up the hive for the first time, you hear that thrum mm. of the bees and you're surrounded by them and there's an incredible adrenaline rush and you can't quite believe you're doing it. And that's how I, that's how I started. And um, I became, yes, very passionate about bees and obviously the added bonus of the honey. But I would go and stand and look at the bees going in and out of the hive and learn so much about their their way of life, if that's the right way of describing it, really. Yeah. But 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 what an incredible organism in a way a bee colony is, and kind of what we can learn from it in a way. I mean that whole cooperative thing that you get, and the waggle dance and all that. Well, maybe maybe we'll come on to that. But so where where is your garden first of all? That's in Suffolk. Okay. In Suffolk, yeah, Great. yes, in the Waveney Valley. And how long ago was this? That was. Um, nearly 20 no more than 20 years ago wow. more than 20 years ago so you've been yeah. doing it ever since I have been doing well I I started off with the one WBC hive then ended up with two and then I made a television series called the wonder of bees about yeah. beekeeping and the idea of that was how to make wildflower honey so we ended up with four hives that we put on a friend's wildflower meadow to see if we could get honey from that so anyway I built up to seven hives and we we splashed out and got an electric extractor so poor old Chris didn't have to do it all by hand wow, endlessly wow. and lots of equipment. But then, rather sadly, I got 
stung, not when I was beekeeping, but I got a, a sting in my um, in my head mm. and I had a very bad anaphylactic mm. reaction my and I had to get it. really mm. well, you need to be terribly careful. Anyway, I gave up I, I gave up at that point because I ended up in hospital and I got lots of lectures from consultants who were saying you mustn't go anywhere near bees. And I said when you say nowhere near bees, I'm mm. in the middle of shooting a television series with Chris <gasps> Packham about bees. How do you feel about that? And he thought I was completely mad. Golly. But he let me continue doing that. But just out of shot, there was a paramedic with an injection full of uh, adrenaline no. ready to hit me if anything went wrong. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I've had years of immunotherapy through the NHS, which has been brilliant. So I would be safe to keep bees again. But in a way, I've kind of moved on a bit and I'm become yeah. more generally interested in, in campaigner in, yeah and pollinators more generally and insects generally yeah yeah god that's quite brave though I mean I've seen Adam having a um going into anaphylaxis from from again being stung on the head I wonder if that's more common as a as a thing of causing anaphylaxis rather than a sort of finger or um and Nicola I bet you'll know about that well, yes, it's uh, bee stings are funny things. Sometimes you can have a really bad reaction and another time you don't have much of a yeah. reaction, depending on where you get stung, whether you're stung by a guard bee who's got an awful lot of venom in her compared oh. to a forager bee. Okay. There's so many variables and people respond different ways on different days. It's a funny old subject, but... The guard bees are the ones that chase you up the garden and they're oh, very, yes. very fierce but indeed. They're just um, good at their job. Right? They're good at their job, yes. <laughs> so let's not be prejudiced against the poor old guard bee. <laughs> so I just want to introduce Nicola a bit more. And and so, Nicola, you, you were at Cardiff University. Yes, I, I didn't start off there, but I, I did work there as a bit for a bit. But bees development was started 30 years ago by me. Um, Gosh, as long ago as that, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yes, yes So yes. tell us lots about, about bees for development. <laughs> um, well, it started off my interest really oh. when I was a student in the 70s and 80s. There was a world food problem and it was the time of the Green Revolution and I was working at that time at university on plant proteins that were good for human nutrition and things like that. And then I kind of thought this is a big waste of time and I went off travelling the sort of end of the hippie era. And I just noticed that beekeeping is a really good way for rural people to make income. Mm. And, you know, every every beekeeper becomes a bit of an amateur botanist and gets interested in the environment. So if you get inter people interested in beekeeping, then they become guardians of the environment, but they're incentivized to do it. They get some income. Mm. So uh, we think at the charity that Bees for Development, it's a great way to get people to retain habitat by being beekeepers. Mm. So that's the, the, the premise behind the charity. And so where is it spread? I mean, where is most of your work? We work in the poorest places. So we work with the poorest people in Ethiopia, in Ghana, Uganda, Zimbabwe. We used to work uh, in a wider range of countries around the world, but nowadays the most poor people are in Africa. So mm. that's where most of our work is now. Mm. And actually deforestation in Africa mm. is worse than anywhere else. So so the crisis is more severe. So we're doing a lot of beekeeping development, but that also includes a lot of reforestation and habitat mm. protection, which is sort of dual aim. So we're working to alleviate poverty, but with a twin aim of maintaining biodiversity at the same time. And so, do they then, or do you then market the honey locally, or is yes, it, yeah. yes, uh, beekeeping's kind of easy actually, and people in poor countries have got really good indigenous knowledge. Mm. So we're not teaching them beekeeping, but we're helping them to do more of it and make more of an income from it. And very often, our work is about market chains and mm. getting a good market for their yeah. produce because. A poor person doesn't want to do beekeeping unless they have a market for the honey. So, so market's a very important part of our work. So will you give us an exact example of one of your projects, for instance, and sort of take it from the bee to, <laughs> to the mouth of somebody that's eating the honey? Okay. Um, we're working a new area for us is Don Corcoran in Ghana, mm. and that's a bit of a, a remote bit of Ghana that nobody much knows about but actually it's where most of the charcoal comes from there are very poor people there 
a lot of young people without jobs and a quick way for them to get income is to cut forest and make charcoal, which is illegal. Mm. So a few years ago, we introduced beekeeping. Nobody was beekeeping there before. And it's just taken off. These young men say it's easier to do beekeeping than to make charcoal and they can get good cash from the honey and the beeswax and we're working on those market chains to make sure they do get good money for them. Um, so that's Fantastic. a good example. So it's it's working really well. The we, problem for us is keeping up with demand Wait, for, the for the honey. Yeah, well, and for, for the honey. For training, yes. Oh, for the training, yeah. Yes, yes. So that works well. <laughs> and, and Martha, how did you get involved with the charity? I got involved through a lovely colleague of mine, Bill Turnbull, who you may remember was a presenter of BBC Breakfast. And in fact, the day today, the day that we're talking to you on, is the anniversary of Bill's death from prostate cancer uh, a year ago. And he mm. was an, um, you know, he was much loved for many reasons, but Nicola and I are especially fond of him because of the incredible work that he did for Bees for Development, including he was a patron like me, but I'm, I'm not going to do what Bill did, which is he ran a marathon in a bee outfit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in a, yes. in a bee, in, as a beekeeper in a bee veil. <laughs> And he was just a huge champion and said, this is an amazing charity because it's, you know, it's about bees, so you love it, Martha, but also it's about development. And mm. that's what I like about it. It's, you know, it's a small charity, so there aren't massive overheads. It's based in Monmouth. But I just particularly like the way it is so direct. And as Nicola says, of course, there are lots of people who need training to be beekeepers, but there are lots of people who keep bees in log hives in very traditional ways a lot of women and I think the evidence is that the women will spend a lot of their money on lessons for their children so it's a real kind of virtuous circle and they know how to look after their environment as they've been doing for uh, many many years but it's about you know getting the honey to the right place and then it's it's a fantastic cash crop yeah absolutely and so will you will you talk more about your sort of work of back closer to home perhaps of your research and what we can do as gardeners so it, it's like the bee the butterfly are as you've said earlier when we were chatting are the sort of buzzwords of the moment but can we talk a bit more about that I mean maybe first of all tips for gardeners for all pollinators but then extend it yes I mean we like the honeybee because she brings with her tangible benefits for humans so you can incentivize humans to care for honeybees but actually if a plant has got a flower on it it's trying to attract an insect mm -hmm. and we know that uh, I mean the word insectageddon has been used mm -hmm. it's a tremendous crisis for insects at the moment and we have to restore not just species of insects but the abundance of insects mm. so really we have to just let if it flowers let it flower because it's flowering to feed some insect or other so of course bees are important and we love all the pollinators but actually all insects have their role there's no soil without insects there's no in britain there's no birds without insects all british birds feed on insects at some stage of their life cycle so it's not Pollination is important, but it's more than just producing seeds and fruit. It's the whole life on Earth depends on insects. Mm. And we didn't really notice in recent years that we were just destroying them and building a habitat that doesn't support them. But I think we know now it's time. Gardeners have got to stop using pesticides. Mm. We've got to stop complaining about insects and try and help them to recover. Mm. And I think it's also about taking a different approach to gardening, not for every garden, of course, but allowing wilder areas. And I remember somebody saying to me, the thing about brambles is they're, they're a superfood for insects. And I used to look at brambles. Well, I was very happy to have the blackberries, but generally you think, oh, no, brambles. And now I just look at what's happening above the brambles and you see it's just filled with bees and butterflies and you get a kind of different approach your eye looks mm. different and this I've been doing like lots of people no mo may for uh, quite a while um but this year I left a whole area of thistles that in conventional terms looked you know a right old mess but when I looked at it I mean I've I've become you know mad bee spotter and I've got charts of bees and dragonflies and once you start looking at 
what the plants are doing to help the insects. It gives you a very different view, doesn't it? I mean, I know mm. you've been very keen on your, your seeds and for, for, for bees mm. and butterflies, haven't you, for a long while now? Well, and I think thistles are a really good example of, I mean, you know, of this thing of not just thinking of a plant for us, but it's what it does for insects. But then also with thistles, it's what it does for birds. And so that's why I love it in all its stages. The thistle family is a really good example. And the bramble family in exactly the same way, which is it's absolutely full of nectar and pollen, which, as you all know, as regular listeners, I hope, of this podcast, the, the protein comes from the pollen and the nectar gives the carbohydrate and you need that and you need a good wide range of sources of that, like we need now, we're told, 20 a day at least. But it's also then once they finish flowering, there's then seeds. And in the case of both, obviously, blackberries and all the thistle family, there's incredibly high protein source for, for birds. So it's thinking of plants in that way. I always think it's like the quadruple bottom line is like, you know, if you're an accountant or whatever, and I try and kind of assess plants now much less how beautiful they are important how productive they are important but also it's it's what they not only do for us but what they do for everyone else it sounds sanctimonious but actually just as you say martha it just enhances your enjoyment of that plant and and it, uh, it enhances one's knowledge and sensitivity to a form of a flower i mean i used to be crazy on big heavy dahlias and i still love them a little bit, you know, occasionally, but I'm much crazier now on the single and the anemone flower varieties because they're stuffed full of pollen and nectar. And so, yeah, it's just having a more all-round view of a plant, isn't it? And I guess also, and Nicola, you, you would know more about this than me, but it's also thinking of planting for as long a period throughout the year as possible. So I've got some Mahonia, which is not the prettiest plant, but it is an early flower. Mm -hmm. And then later in the year... You know, it's ivy is, is the sustaining plant, isn't yes, it? Yes, just coming out now, first of the ivy flowers. But don't you think it's nice to see goldfinches feeding on your thistles <laughs> yeah. instead of on niger seed that we all go and buy as well? Yeah. You yeah. suddenly realise how it, it's all knitted up together. We have to feed everything, actually. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I, love, I, I we're, we're sitting in my workroom at the moment, and um, one of the things I love is it's got glass all the way along one wall, and uh, I get up very early in the morning, as I've already mentioned, and it's when often birds feed most actively, but also if it's sunny, bees and, and butterflies are around before it gets too hot. And um, is that right? I mean, certainly butterflies. No, uh, it, well, the bumblebees, bumblebees especially are yeah. out early, but what, it's a bit like birds, really. Once you can begin to identify a few of the bee species, then it all brings a whole new dimension yeah. to the garden. And the, the hairy footed flower bee. That's, that's very good. Big, that's big very good. Me now. That's, I don't want to say it's an easy one, but that's a good one because very early in spring when the pulmonaria comes out, indeed, you can see, you know, it's a big thing when do you see the first hairy footed flower bee. <laughs> but it's quite the thing. If you, if you can see what flower a bee is foraging on, it gives you a big clue to what species she is. So if you see oh. a bee in a foxglove, then that's going to be a garden bumblebee because they've got the longest tongue of any bumblebee. And then it's a bit like goldfinches. Once you see them on the feeder, you can identify goldfinches when they're flying over or you see them somewhere else. It's the same with bees. Once you really have confidence that you've identified one species correctly then you can begin to see it in other places and know what it That's is. That's really interesting because I, it's very easy to confuse, isn't it, the guard, garden bumblebee with a white-tailed bumblebee. Yes. So, yes. If it's, so if it's in a foxglove, is that...? Yes, or an aquilegia, something with a long corolla, that's going to be a garden bumblebee. And it's got the longest tongue of any bumblebee in the world. And its face, I think, its face looks a bit like a horse, actually. It's got a big black face with a big long tongue. That's a garden mm. bumblebee. And once you begin to get your eye in, mm. you, it just adds so much interest to your garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've sort of chatted about obviously not using insecticides. I mean, please, please, please. And then thinking about succession. So from our Mahonias to our Ivies, uh, leaving things for a certain amount of wildness. So brambles, dandelions in the lawn, no mo may, etc. Any other tips that we really feel we, we, must, we must 
prod people with? Well, I was super shocked at Chelsea Flower Show when a lady asked me how to control leaf cutter bees in her roses. Mm. And I thought, you lucky thing having leaf cutter bees. If you could see their beautiful, yes. beautiful nests, that's the loveliest thing. Much more yeah. beautiful than any old rose. Anyway. <laughs> And also I think when we so been, learning is what you're is is yeah. what you're saying. So because learning about them and identifying them means you care about them is kind yes. of that's it. So really start get it stuck in. I mean, I used to have on the wall here a chart of bumblebees. And and almost like when I was a child with wildflowers or with birds, I would you tick them off. And it it, it, it that is slightly acquisitive in a way, yes. but I think it does mean that you you're more passionate about them because you know them. You get going. It it it's quite hard to tell all the nobody can. Nobody can tell all the bee species apart, but you can begin to recognise that you've got different ones. And in just a humble, normal garden, you'll actually have a couple of hundred different insect species there. Of course, nobody can put a name on all of them, but their name doesn't matter. It's just identifying them and being aware of them mm. gets you it just adds another dimension. And you don't have to have a big garden, do you? No. I mean, if you look at some of the plants, I mean, a pot of lavender, uh, a pot of nepeta can sustain quite a lot of bees. And that's very important in cities, actually, isn't it, where yes. there's not enough forage? Yes. I think it's amazing when a local supermarket push their plants out in the morning. Mm. There's foragers on those mm. lavenders and things really fast, which shows that the foragers are all the time scanning and looking mm for a little bit of food where they can find it. And um, water is is another thing, isn't it? I mean, it happens to be raining today, but uh, we're apparently about to hit a, a bit of a heat wave. And so putting, is, is that right, shallow water out with stones in a, in a bowl yes, is an important thing. Yes, that's good. That's always nice. And especially honeybees, even in winter, if they're trying to release their honey stores, they can be having a requirement for water. So even all year round, having some liquid water available, not just for insects, but for birds as well. Mm. And practice. stranded honey, um, stranded bumblebees. Yes. Um, it, 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 do you, uh, yes. I put a little bit of sugar water, yes. is that right? Sugar or a tiny finger full of honey, just and you can see them put their proboscis out and take a little bit of life-saving carbohydrate. And yes. because I mean, I don't, really don't understand how they fly at all, bumblebee. I mean, their body mass mm. for what they're able to do is so it's no wonder they conk yes. out quite yes. regularly. Yes. But yes, you're right, honey would be better for them then. But I, is there a thing the about feeding honey? Is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny, just a tiny pinhead of honey will get them going again. Lovely. And so if you find, like, quite often at this time of year, you find a bumblebee crawling around on, on the floor inside the house. And so that's exactly what, I mean, I just tend to get them under a piece of paper and yes. take them out. But yes. it, would it be better yes. to feed them before you release them? If, if they're exhausted because mm. they've been trying to get out yeah. the window, then they probably could do with a bit of carbohydrate just to give them the fuel to get home. Yeah. yeah. And what do you find, Sarah, that are your most popular plants for bees do you, I mean you've got so many here but which which are the ones that are most popular? well talking of the foxglove I mean I remember when I made the bees butterflies and blooms program 15 or so years ago I remember um a, a really fantastic um guy teaching me that look at the shape of the flower and the, a foxglove or you know, any spire basically is fantastic because there is very little energy from a bee to get completely stuffed because it's like a high rise. It's <laughs> like Canary Wharf of cafes, basically. It's how he <laughs> described brilliant. it to me. Yeah. And I love that. And so to just thinking of the form. And then he also taught me to look at, at sort of face flowers, so-called in floristry, so sort of big plateaus. And the butterflies particularly, he said that with their longer proboscis, can land on a face flower and they will have a sort of almost like a helicopter landing pad and it's much easier for them to be more stable. And so so land, feed, with even when it's quite windy. And so I now, I'm really aware when I'm sort of putting together a border to try and have, of course, mainly singles, um, because, of course, double flowers, their nectaries have been bred into be petaloid, you know, petals, extra petals, but also to have spires, to have face flowers, to have all that range, as well as as well as something from February until November 
as we've talked about, but those different forms of flowers um, because they attract different things. I mean, one of the things we've found with climate change that we have um, the hummingbird hawk moth here so much. Is that a generalised yes, trend? That's hummingbird hawk moth is actually quite a common moth yeah. and it just needs... But most people have never seen it because mm. they've never gone out and looked. But it's uh, valerian, isn't it? Red valerian, is yes, that what they like? And honeysuckle out now. You can see them on. It's a wonderful moth and it looks so exotic. And yet mm. it's a relatively common British species of moth. Wonderful. Really? And so not it's nothing to do with the warmer summers, no. It's always it's, been here. Yes, yes, absolutely. But of course they're more they're out in the evenings when yeah. people aren't looking. Yeah, but yes, this gorgeous. is something I've gotten to more actually, in, in, <laughs> as well as bees. I was given a, a a moth trap as a present, <gasps> and so I put we've created a wildflower meadow, and I put that out. I haven't that, actually I have not done it this summer, but I must. Um, and I, I love that kind of trying to. I mean, it's so hard to identify but moths. Moths are and... so secret because they're at night, <laughs> but there's this fabulous diversity of moths mm. in in everybody's garden. There's moths to see. They, um, they're exquisitely beautiful, aren't they? The, yes, the yes. hawk with the different hawk moths. Yes. And so many i remember i mean we did a we're actually doing a moth trap here in a couple of weeks hopefully when it's going to be this heat wave and i'm dying for it because the guy who did it he did it 15 years ago and hopefully i'm i'm hoping i mean he recorded amazing number 62 um species wow. Can that be? but i'm hoping yeah. that we'll be better now well, this is uh, insect heaven. I yeah, think. but they've just got such terrible PR, haven't they? Because I can remember when I've talked about it on on air on the Today program, the other presenters look at me because they they think they think it's clothes moths. You know, yes. like, how can you like so, moths so much? You know, and so they, they they've got a big gosh. uphill battle to win over gosh. public minds. I think, and mm. they think a moth trap is you know for your jumpers. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I don't like it when they eat my jumpers. But yeah. there are some. I mean, how many species of moth are there? And far, far more than butterflies. Uh, yes, aren't absolutely. There? But all yeah. these lovely night-scented things. Mm. Yeah. They're night-scented, not to please us, mm. but they're attracting, they're pollinating insects, which are moths. So there's a whole world to explore out there. You must the get dusk. amazing ones here, actually. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. And I, again, I mean, that's how I understood the form of the trumpet flower like Nicotiana sylvestris or jasmine or trachysperm and jasminoides they're all white they all have that tubular flower form they're all perfumed because they draw in the moths by their scent and then they can feed when and no one else has stolen the nectar already and now you know I, I look at flowers like that and I think yeah well of course you're scented and of course you're white because you're moth pollinated and um and it just it just makes one understand things in a deeper way doesn't it yes and makes it all the more interesting or exactly all the more rewarding um and so a walk becomes not just a walk but my dad was a real naturalist he used to have this thing called uh nature walks with uncle john and i i just i sort of wish i'd done it more with my children but i haven't yet got many grandchildren but i really want to sort of do nature walks with auntie sarah because it's like uh, the more you see the more you want to see and the more you care and i guess that's the thing and the less the less you want to get rid of those weeds and things. And I think yeah. also learning those names from a, an early age. I spent part of my childhood at, here in Sussex in a village called Ditchley. And so when I, we w- went to live in Suffolk, I knew so many of the things. I'd look at a hedgerow and go, well, that's bread and butter. I think, what is that really? Yes. Hawthorn. But you know all the kind of the names yes. that you learned as a child and they stay yeah. with you, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, goose grass and... Sticky Willy and all those kind of funny um, <laughs> names. Yeah, absolutely. Cookie flour. So uh, both of you, and anything that you want to sort of say as a call to arms to our listeners? Well, what we'd love is that people would support our charity. As yeah. Martha said, we're quite a small charity. We don't work in a huge number of countries. We work in a rather small number with very excellent partners and as it's such a small charity, Nicola and I are always sort of scratching our heads of ways that we can possibly uh, raise money for it. And we've had quite a lot of success with the idea of having a garden party. We had the first year was um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, name drop, name drop, let, let us have Lambeth Palace for it. And then since then, we've held it in the uh, private gardens in uh, Marlborough House on the Mall. Mm-hmm. 
And we've been lucky to have, uh, well, when she was uh, Princess of Wales, uh, Camilla came. And then this year, as Queen, she came back Brilliant. and showed a huge interest by going around all the different stalls that we had and large numbers of people. And we were very lucky because it was a gorgeous summer's day, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. We're, we're very fortunate to have the Queen Bee herself <laughs> as the president of our charity, even Excellent. though we're a very small charity, as I keep saying. And we had also a very eccentric thing, but that's done well for, for us from a fundraising point of view. And that's uh, an auction of bee pictures. So we ask artists and celebrities and just lots of people to do a picture of a bee and then we um, have a, a gallery and auction them all off. And we've had some very big names, Anthony Gormley, wow, Grace and Perry did a very funny one, rather cheeky one of a beehive, as you can imagine. And that's that's worked very well for us, hasn't it? Yes, it's a, a funny thing because everybody in the back of their mind, they like bees mm. somehow. And honey is also such a wholesome food. Mm. It, there's a big difference in a jar of honey and a jar of jam. Honey mm. has a lot of cultural value. Every society puts value on honey. Mm. The Quran, the Bible, all the religious texts extol because it was the first sweet food and also medicine mm. that people had. So actually in the back of everybody's head, there's a, there's a, a sort of feeling that bees and honey are wholesome and good and, uh, and Deserve it's come support. back. And honey's yes. come back as medicine. A friend of mine who's had a problem with a wound has been treated on the NHS yes. with, mm. with surgical strength honey yes. bandages. It which works. Very, yeah. It works. And uh, bugs can't become resistant to honey. Really? Mm, quite. And oh, then we quite. haven't even talked about beeswax, which, again, has lots of spiritual connotations, all the candles in church. And you sell an amazing range of candles, don't you? Yes, one of the... Uh, ways we raise income for our charity. We have a, a, a shop in Monmouth, a small and beautiful shop selling all things bee-related and bee paraphernalia. Mm. So beautiful and can you candles. access that online? Yes, yes. So you do have mail order? <laughs> we do. Lots of beautiful bee things. and Very tempting jewellery. <laughs> <laughs> everything helps our charity, yes. Fabulous. So it's very interesting, the word medicine... In most languages, honey is an M word, like miel, mod, mm. madu, Russian for honey is mod. And in English, of course, we have mead, which is mm. honey wine. And so some people say that the root of the word medicine derives from honey because mm. it was the first medicine that people had. And still people in very poor countries they don't regard honey as an everyday food. It's a special tonic that you give to people when they're poorly, to nursing mothers, to children. So you don't just slather it on toast. It's too precious. But it mustn't be heated and, and sort of distilled and refined, must it? I mean, the, the raw it is, the nearer it is to straight out of the hive, the better. Yes, yes. If you heat honey, you destroy really a lot of its uh, properties. Mm. So if it's um, pasteurized... It's not so good. No, no, we don't like pasteurized no. honey. But uh, in Ethiopia, where we work, people buy honey by the spoonful. Mm. And it's really regarded as a much more special food than the way we regard it here mm. in rich countries. Yeah. Well, I remember um, when I was a junior doctor and I was working on the pediatric ward. Um, and I've talked about this in a previous podcast relevant to the vinegar part of this. But I used to have my aunt encouraged me to have honiger every morning. And having been getting, you know, a cold or something every six weeks or so, I was continually getting minor bugs. I started on Hunnegar every morning. And, um, and that was a good loaded teaspoon of unpasteurized honey with a tablespoon of organic cider vinegar with the mother uh, in warm, not boiling water. And I stopped getting ill. And so it has such an effect on our immune system, I, I think. It's, yes, it is a sort um, of these recipes... You find them all around the world, mm. so they must have a scientific basis because mm. they're so culturally adopted and well-known. Oh, I'm going to try that before I start on air on the Today programme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a bit of Hanukkah. <laughs> I know, and with, and with the new COVID strain, we're all going to need every bit where we help, help we can get, I think. Great. Thank you uh, incredibly both for coming such a long way to talk about it. And, yeah, I'm certainly going to be supporting Bees for Development, and I hope... Quite a lot of you will too. Thank you so much. 
Thanks very much for listening to Grow Cookie to Range. And I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed chatting about Bees for Development. What a brilliant organization and what a brilliant idea. And next week, I'm talking to a friend of mine, Arabella Preston. I call her Ari, who is the co-founder of two brands I hugely admire. One is Votary, which is skincare products. And the next is Verdon, which is the most wonderful, luscious bath and skin products. And they smell delicious. So I'm going to talk to her as a gardener as to how gardening has influenced her brand. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.